welcome. Uh, so on the last episode, uh, we did speak a little bit about the mechanics of AI. Uh, so John and Ari here covered things like vector databases, embeddings, and sort of how to bridge the gap between AI and a human context. So today we're going to take a little bit of a different perspective. We're going to round that out uh, with a discussion to include generative AI or gen AI. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, John and Ari here. Great. Thanks, Victoria. Hello, everybody. Okay, cool. So yeah, we did get into um, uh, vector databases, LLMs, and search. We touched on gen AI. We're going to do that. But before we go into gen AI, let's take a little stroll down memory lane. There's been a huge evolution of uh, uh, internet and the AI technologies since you and I started a company in 1996. I know, I know. It's been a while, right? Yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Time flies. <laughs> so um, uh, maybe you can help everybody just understand from those prehistoric days when you were young. <laughs> the dinosaur days of the internet. <laughs> to now, what has the evolution been? What are some of the buzzwords? Let's talk it through. For sure. Uh, and it has always been a technological hurdle to get your content onto the web. Whether it was a blog, whether it was a product page, whatever it was, there was either the need for technology or the need of someone like yourself. Uh, you probably wouldn't appreciate it if I ever called you a webmaster. <laughs> but back in the day, when it really was difficult to build a website and to update a website, there was this concept that we used to use at Fatwire called the webmaster bottleneck. And it just meant if you had marketing folks like Danielle, and Victoria that wanted to get those updates on the site, change the homepage, oh, we need a new blog post, press release, whatever it was, you had to email, fax, whatever, that content to a technical person who knew how to get it onto uh, the website. And guess what? You were busy. You didn't have time. Uh, you thought it wasn't worthwhile. I guess it's all silly marketing stuff. <laughs> so there was that bottleneck, and it's really where, where it started. I'll highlight one more thing, and I'm sure you have some thoughts on this too. Where Fatwire came in was to say, well, wait a second, maybe we don't need the webmaster to get this content onto the web. There should be software and web content management. These content management systems evolved. Fatwire was one of them. And it let a non-technical person push that content to the web. Right. And in 1996, web pages were primarily static. And uh, that first content management system that we built took the webmaster bottleneck out of the loop and allowed marketing to directly enter a press release or a case study yep. or something like that, right? Totally. Um, but that's all static content. The end user that was browsing the web would then just see a static case study on the, on the website. The next step was when websites became interactive, they yep. became commercial, and you were looking through product catalogs and um, uh, entering, you know, filling a shopping cart and so forth. And then that was the beginning of a more dynamic experience. Totally. But still not Web 2.0. No. Just commerce. Correct. What's Web 2.0? I mean, this is going back in time, but what was Web 2.0? I know. It sounds really exciting. Ooh, Tell me a little yeah. about Web 2.0. Uh, but yeah, it's a good point with databases, the more dynamic. We were using the term persuasive content management because we were using technology to say, I don't think we need to create all these product pages. Why don't we just load them with a template from the database? But you're right, Ari. Then Web 2.0 came out, which was going back to the individual. But the individual is everybody, not the marketing department. It's everybody. It was social media. It was way back in the day, MySpace. Hmm. <laughs> then later, Facebook and those types of social media sites. So everyone was a content publisher. Everyone could get content onto the web. So, yeah, the technology kind of moved to the apps and your mobile device and everything else. But, yeah, that was a huge innovation. How do I get this content onto the web? That was Web 2.0. Yeah, and I feel like that was one branch in the evolution. But at the same time, the commerce branch, and we'll use Amazon as sort of the, you know, the, the greatest example of that, was marching forward where, yes, you had people could do product reviews and so forth, kind of web 2.0-y social, but it was really marching forward with um, uh, with e-commerce and 
becoming super intelligent, not AI yet, yeah, <laughs> but very <laughs> intelligent is, yeah. for uh, in terms of making recommendations. People who bought this also bought that, having uh, personalized banners and so forth. So you started be, uh, having more intelligent sites that had a very clear business purpose. You know, the social media, it's still not clear other than it being a venue for placing ads, what the business purpose is for a lot of that. But commerce, persuasive commerce and so forth, that branch yep. has, I think, uh, a ton of legs. Both that and the social branch have AI, <laughs> very scary in some instances, AI possibilities, but the commerce branch certainly does. You're right. And you may disagree where like real AI kind of starts and ends and everything else. But I do think it's a fair point. Your example with Amazon uh, addressed what was referred to as collaborative filtering, which was what should I put on the homepage? When Ari comes to the homepage, what should Ari see on Amazon.com, the main page? And you really had two choices. Either go to the marketing team, once again, Victoria and Danielle saying, we want to highlight this product. So when Ari comes in, he should see this list of products. Whereas people were starting to say, hmm, that's not a bad idea, but maybe we should just look at what everyone else is buying, sharing, etc. Filter all of that stuff out, especially people that do things similar to Ari, and that should drive it. So you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't call that AI, but it's starting almost it's machine there. learning. It's getting there to say, look at what everyone else is doing. It's kind of a large a corpus of information and decide put this when Ari comes to Amazon. Yeah. And I would call that AI because so AI is a very loose and broad term. Yeah, you know, very broad. And um, if we key in on the two words, artificial and intelligence, and think about intelligence, intelligence is not consciousness. Yep. Intelligence is not uh, general intelligence, I can do anything. Yep. Intelligence is really can be an expert system that's very good at one thing. Yep. It can be non-flexible. And, um, you know, that's where if you have the data as to, like, what people like this current visitor typically want to buy and do buy, yep. mine the data and stick that product on the homepage and sell it. Right. Um, <laughs> that's intelligence. Yeah. Totally. It's not general intelligence. Totally. It reminds me of my commute almost every morning when I see a stoplight that is still staying green on the traffic coming across, even though no one is still there. It's not intelligent. It doesn't understand what the context of what's going on and everything else. So it's not intelligent. But you're exactly right. So you would agree that's a, a first step, this yeah. collaborative filtering as you start to get to uh, intelligence like my pet hamster. Uh -huh. <laughs> it keeps the exactly. wheels spinning. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, so let's talk about, all right, so in our last episode, we uh, really focused on search yeah. and vector databases, large language models and embeddings. Yeah. Uh, which is really interesting stuff. And we just touched on what is arguably the most exciting thing that's happening right now, which is Gen AI, generative AI. Um, so what do you see as some of the real world applications today? And, uh, you know, what, what's, what's going on with Gen AI? Oh, totally. Um, and uh, it's not just for your kids anymore. <laughs> as we all know, and we all worry as parents that our kids are using ChatGPT and these other tools for writing your school paper, doing your research report and everything else. And I'm sure everyone's played with ChatGPT2, oh, write me an article. My dad's big into rhododendron. So when I was showing him how ChatGPT worked, I just said, give me three paragraphs about why rhododendrons are great. And he was impressed with the results too. But to your point though, and especially as it relates a little bit more to the hawk search world, it does in a very effective way, fill the gaps for, I would say smaller scale requirements so I don't think to the point that Ari's brought up a number of times, it's it's not fully there for maybe large amounts of content, but there's three that stand out. The first one is a lot of times you need a little bit of extra content to round out what we call a landing page. So a landing page is essentially a category page. Here are all the products of this specific category or of this specific brand or partner or what have you. And from an SEO perspective, it is helpful to have one or two paragraphs. 
which normally would require a human to go in, you go in your WYSIWYG tool and put in that information. Imagine if there's a magic button that says, click here for the AI assistant, you describe what you want, it looks at the products in the picture plus your description and generates the content. Mm -hmm. There are two other examples, but any comments so yeah, far? Yeah, there is. I'm like, ready okay, to jump on I don't want to keep talking forever. Okay. So, you know, what's really exciting about that is that, and, and, and I think that this has a lot of legs and will transform the entire uh, World Wide Web, will go away in the interaction on that, is that generative AI is so strong, even today, that it's not just necessarily being smart as to which picture or product to show you, but it can rewrite the product description and it can have yep. enough information about you to know what your interests are. So that when it shows a set of hiking boots yep. to you, it's going to talk about how you can go hiking with these and it shows them to me and it talks about how I can they're durable and I can work on my garden with it or whatever, you know, get dirty hiking boots and so forth and write custom uh, product descriptions and even create a custom image to make that product more compelling. And that's, that's really amazing because when in the, we just spoke about the um, personalization, we didn't use that term, but personalization on amazon.com yeah. and so forth, right? So it, it, it picks the right product to show you, but now it's going to pick the right product and show it to you in a way that you relate as opposed to the generic way. Right. And this is, it's, it's interesting. And once again, you might say, John, you're going a little bit off the path here because it's not exactly the way that it works. But I think it is interesting if you go back to what we were talking on the last episode which is this idea of, well, when I have all these vectors, I can understand what's near. Like I know this is near in a product search or what have you, but it is a lot of what's going on when it's writing a paragraph. Mm -hmm. It knows when it starts the first part of the sentence, it knows what's near when it looked at all of the other things that were written. What is the next word that is near when people typically write this out? So I know it's a little bit of a tangent, yeah. but well, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's similar. It's still built yeah. off that model, but what's the next thing you're going to say? It's kind of near what I have thought before or that kind of thing. Well, the big breakthrough that happened, I think, in 2019 on a paper uh, published from Google uh, called All You Need Is Attention. And that was where the uh, transformer yeah. uh, model and uh, large language model uh, neural nets uh, came in. And in that transformer model, what it really does is that in this high dimensional space with concepts like a car and a tree and so forth, it's able to look forward into multiple words and have almost a gravitational component mm -hmm. to every word and pull them nearer. So yeah. they are near, yeah. they become more near each other in that high dimensional space. And that's how you really get to the point where words at the beginning and the end of a sentence can be uh, 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 it can, can be attracted to each other and better understood. And that nearness is necessary, not just for recognizing the two concepts are similar, but in a generative sense, figuring out what the most likely next word is as you're generating text. And that's yeah. another crazy thing is that these LLM models are almost, I mean, basically just generating one word at yeah, a time. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no understanding of what they're saying, just what's the most... Right, you know, the, the next word in the sentence that would be most similar to all the millions and millions of sentences I've already looked at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and one other use case to get back to your question about the business model and, and how it helps is plugging that gap in a hole. And uh, once again, we're going to go back uh, showing how old we are in terms of technology. We've been around ETL, extract, transform and load so many times because the data I have over here my database, my ERP, whatever that system is, before it gets into my system, which in our case could be the index that you would be searching against, that transformation can be painful. Mm -hmm. You call the field this, we call the field that. But there's also a need in many cases that AI can address now where I'm missing that metadata. I don't have a good description for that product or I don't have the category facet mm -hmm. for that product. Yeah. Or and even there's, just the not, AI. A, there's yeah. not a one-to-one -one mapping 
between the source of the data and the and and, and the uh, destination for the data. Yeah. Um, so it's one to many or many to one or a little bit of both. Yeah. But with AI, you move out of that relational world where you're always thinking in terms of on an ETL that all right, I've got these rows and columns of data, and I need to move it from my SAP system to my Oracle system and just map one column to the other. Here, you. No SQL, you get rid of relational okay. from the beginning. Don right. laughs because he knows I'm a big SQL fan. And uh, and a big yeah. regular expression. I, yeah. My brain is a, is a, is a relational database. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and instead, you're just pulling content in a non-structured way into another system. And then perhaps you need another layer of intelligence for that other system to be able to interpret this, this content that's been transferred. Totally, yeah. And then the final one, just to wrap up your question, like how are we using it? And at least in our world, how it adds value. And it might just seem so simple because we're kind of addressing this filling the gap, but it's not unusual in a lot of systems like ours where we would allow the end user, that merchandiser who wants to kind of configure or alter or adjust the settings inside of uh, our platform to suggest synonyms. And most mm -hmm. of the time we'd have to tell the person like, oh, you, you have some synonyms? You could use synonyms. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're in New York. Everyone has a cold. Uh, yeah. here in New York. <laughs> <coughs> and we've even gone as far, Ari, as sometimes saying we'll pre-build sets of synonyms for different industries. And that's helpful. But what about if AI can come in and make that suggestion for you? Right, right. So we've got the ability to generate... <coughs> Uh, to generate pages yep. or content, product descriptions, product images, and so forth. So that's one generative sense. We have the ability to essentially redefine what ETL is from the very beginning and to be able <coughs> to map uh, data from one system to another based on its true content rather than its formal structure. Yep. And then also, and this is more on the, uh, I think, uh, often in the search side, um, is to be able to recognize uh, synonyms. <coughs> More than that, it can be um, uh, uh, units of measurement to be able to, you know, yep. recognize that some, this is in centimeters and that one's in inches and so forth. Yeah, be able to connect that so that as information then is being organized or searched for, um, person can use their own language rather than the specific <laughs> language that whoever keyed up the data in the first place was using. Right and still find that information. Yeah. yeah. You know, what I see all of this doing, it's going to be amazing, is completely changing the way we interact on the internet. <coughs> right yeah. now, it's clear that you are interacting with a machine. When I'm on, let's, let's just use Amazon.com. I know yeah. that there's this machine in the background. I um, have modified my behavior to uh dumb it down and, and interact with that machine the way I get the machine to do what I want and not just use the way I would speak to you know my friends or my wife or something like that right um I, I speak to Amazon a little bit differently and I um and I expect that Amazon is going to take me from sort of one page to another page to another page ultimately to a shopping cart and ultimately to a checkout screen yeah with generative capabilities, Amazon will be a very sophisticated salesperson or um, personal assistant or uh, strategic advisor. Yep. And I will just begin telling, you know, I'm going on a trip to the Himalayas. This is going to be amazing. And I packed this and that and I'm going with this person. And, you know, I don't know if... if this is going to be a problem or stuff. And it's like, oh, wow, that is amazing. You know what? Did you remember to, uh, you know, bring X and Y? And did you know that the Sherpas really like it if you say such and such and you give them this little gift and so on? And next thing you know, there is no website that is a hierarchy of pages. There's just this intelligent Amazon sort of thing. Right. And once you do that, you also move away from having to have a formal browser, because now your entire interaction could be with voice on uh, Alexa, for example. I'm like pushing Amazon here, but because um, uh, that was one challenge that's been out there. It's like, well, how do we actually 
go through a real experience with Alexa because it's got to like say, oh, you're going from one page to another. No, right. It's a smart advisor. Right. A whole different thing. Yeah. I remember, and once again, to go back in time, uh, we were always so excited at FatWire because at that time when you had an interface for an administrator, it was often called a GUI, a graphical user interface. And it was a form. You filled out a form. And we were so excited because we called it a business user mm -hmm. interface. It was a little easier to use. It essentially still was a GUI, but that was an interesting approach. What you're talking about is either a conversational user yeah. interface. I know some people talk about it, a brain user interface. Like we can really start talking about, why don't we have to say it? Why don't I just think it? And there's a chip in my head without going there. The point is you're right. Forget graphical user interface. My God, like that's way gone. Right. It's a conversational user interface. It's some other type of user interface. Because in the end, we want to work backwards from the user, <laughs> the person that needs yeah. something in a search. Account. And it needs to be contextual. It has to have built up history with you as an individual sure. over time. Yeah. And then understand what your current situation is and interact with you with that level of intelligence. I have to say that even the large language models today do provide some of those capabilities where, you know, in the background, you're just basically augmenting your query with um, some contextual information and maybe some history or, or, or something like that. But yeah, it's totally, you know, the conversation builds over time. You can say, you know, prune down that uh, description or so forth, and it does it. Yeah. Yeah, one small example. So we were first getting involved with all of the AI work at Bridgeline. We were working with the developer. And I literally asked him this question to say, can you add another variable so I could pass in that variable when I'm uh, hitting the, the back end API? And he really was scratching his head at first. Like, no, I want to pass in like a little more info. He said, just put it in the paragraph. <laughs> you don't have to add another. There's no more variable. Yeah. Like the variable is the question. And when you hear about prompts and everything else, it's like, those aren't additional fields. They're all going into the same. Exactly. Regard. There are no fields. This is not no more variables. <laughs> yeah. It's not structured. And yeah. you know what is interesting is that you almost need to go and find historians that can describe how did people get by in 1920? Oh, they went to a store and the tailor at the store spoke with them and asked them yeah. questions and together they ended up making a suit. And then that historian will train the next Amazon.com website. Right. Um, you know, it's really amazing because the, the coding behind all of this is really all the same from one to another. It's the data that trains that site where you train one to do one thing, you train another one to do another. That is the difference. So that... Yeah. Finding a good historian that knows how things worked when people interacted with people so that we get off of our uh, people interacting with computers uh, mindset and get back to what's a more natural interaction. Exactly. That yeah. is the future. Yeah. Okay, cool. I agree. <laughs> All right. So let's deep dive on that. Not now we don't have enough time. Okay. But let's get back together and talk about how this could be completely totally. disruptive throw away all this stuff. It's been a short time. It's only been 25 years that we've been brainwashed to interact with machines in this way. But yeah. It's going to be hard to reset ourselves and yeah. do things different. We'll get into that. Great. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks you too. I, I know we did cover a lot in today's conversation and I know AI is a very wild space. Uh, a lot of folks don't necessarily know where to start. So I'm sure, you know, as these conversations continue, it'll be incredibly helpful. So uh, we'll have to pause it here and we will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.